Good evening, everyone. Hello. Um, it's an honor to be opening this event on behalf of the Museum of Anthropology. My name is Ria Saxena, and I'm the Public Programs Assistant at MOA. Uh, and I'd just like to welcome everyone to our second event under Artists Unscripted. Uh, the theme for the evening is Queer Homelands. I would firstly like to start off the event by acknowledging that MOA is on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. More so, I would like to emphasize that land acknowledgements are a way to incite a call to action. Uh, I'm honored to be here in the presence of three very powerful humans today. On the bill, we've got Angelic, Alicia, and Kim Mortal. I'm so excited to see and hear all these lovely people perform today and be in conversation with each other. Um, I will be taking more of a backseat for this event and Angelic will be our host for the evening. That said, um, I'll step in if need be and if anyone in the audience or if any of our hosts have any technical difficulties, please do let me know and I'll try my best to resolve it as best as I can. Uh, also, if you have any questions for our panelists today or any comments you'd like to forward along to them, please send them along through the chat function. Uh, without further ado, I'd just like to quickly introduce our host for the evening, Angelic. Angelic is an extremely talented Russian Jewish transgender queer poetry excavator who works with clownery, spoken word, music, and performance sorcery. And they have worked with rabbis, queer clowns, trans politicians, the UN, TEDx, the Vogue Theater here in Vancouver, and the list goes on. And on top of all of that, they are a curator. And what you will be hearing tonight um, and lovely humans that we will all have the pleasure of meeting tonight, all of them were brought together by Angelic this evening um, and it was all curated by them. And I'm just so grateful that I'm getting to witness all of this in action. Um, Angelic, I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Bria. Um, hi, everybody. It's so nice to see everybody's names <laughs> in the Zoom audience. Um, so today our theme, um, something we're exploring is this idea of queer homelands. Um, so I have a little bit of a text to share with you. How does home transcend borders? How does queerness unsplit the root? Queer Homelands today is going to be an evening of poetic performance and conversation by non-binary Filipinx artist Kim Mortal, who you can see under me or beside me. <laughs> um, myself, Angelic, and also first-generation Afro-Caribbean artist Alicia, who's also on cam. Um, you know, you can snap in your house uh, and hype them up. Um, so the artists will each perform their own work and express their intimate relationships of queer diasporas and queer homes. Um, together, they will engage in a conversation on how queer children of refuge, diaspora, migration, and or exile can reclaim access to ancestral healing through the magic of language and performance. So this performance welcomes all people in attendance, including all those that recognize themselves as spellcasters, poetry architects and excavators, refuge seekers, generational cycle of abuse disruptors, gender binary abolitionists, astrologers, and those finding the words back to a sense of home within a queer body. As Alexis DeVoe said, our ancestors left us maps and that is why queer migrants are here tracing back the living maps of our ancestors. Uh, together, the three of us will find the blueprint for healing left in language. So how does queerness pave the way to a new definition of home? How do we recognize kin outside of structures of nuclear families, countries, states, and instead in prayer, poem, and song? Um, so we're here to celebrate, to honor, and to name the rediscovery of the queer ancestral self and pave the way for a new conversation or an old conversation, uh, rather that we are kind of becoming new together uh, through the process of magic, through the process of imagining new homelands and speaking through ancestral truths. Um, so that is kind of what we're doing today. And I would love to just offer a tiny little check-in for people who are interested. Um, if we have, does everybody have the chat function? Is that, is that what we all have? Uh, okay, amazing. Um, 
if everybody could, whoever feels called to, no need to participate, but if you feel called, if you wanna just write a word about what comes to mind when you hear the two words queer homeland together, um, I would love to just see what people are thinking of. So I'll leave, I'll leave a few seconds for that. Beautiful. Um, I'll just read some of these out as they come in. Haven, comfort and connectedness, safety and discovery, warm starlight, freedom and a place of belonging, safe space, bodies and an arcway. I love all those words. That's already a poem. <laughs> um, thank you for sending your words um, through. Um, so we'll start with um, our first performance, which will be a performance by me. So um, I will let the Zoom gods take that away. <laughs> this poem is called To Mama. I define diaspora as the gap when we hug, heart to heart, chest to chest, seemingly so close and yet 7,000 kilometers between us, between Donetsk and Vancouver, Ukraine and Canada, Donbass where God abandoned us, Jews who have memorized the movement of running. When we hug, I'm learning to be still. Perhaps there's nothing to run from, but perhaps there's nothing to run to. Mom, is this home sinking? This body is not occupied by someone else's definition. And now I define this loss as anything but a privilege to not be seen as myself even when you look at me. I define diaspora as a life sentence. The cruelest wall is only as protective as, as it is see-through, translucent, that no matter how hard I pray in English, my mother will only mourn in Russian. What does it mean to forgive between the generations? What must shatter to touch? What is refuge if not a song to buy a gun in? What is America if not the antidote to recognizing our own migrant grief? I have seen how borders curve themselves into my tongue and body, frozen from always moving. I have seen my ancestors one by one become taxidermied in the flesh, stuck in survival. The concave in my chest returns to a home that does not recognize me as one of its own. How hotel carts and bones push up until I am birthed from a pile of immigrant work that I was never born to lay a finger on. That my name on my birth certificate stands in its English womb, pristine white paper. How much cost have I inherited? How much truth can finally set us free? How much rewriting can tell us who we really are? <sighs> finally here, able to speak for all the generations that it took for me to redefine myself so I could absolve us until there's no salt left in this Pacific until the ocean between my home and yours shrinks into a teardrop, until we wipe our faces with our smiles we fought for, with dirty fists and torn kneecaps, glowing hand in hand, an imaginary country growing between us. That was a little poem for my mom. And uh, this, this poem is for my partner. Um, and yeah, sometimes I feel like I really want to describe how I feel to my partner uh, when it comes to uh, being a child of immigrants. And I feel like sometimes I don't have the words and I'm just searching and I'm just searching for those words. Um, so this, this poem is called The Half Immigrant Mouth Sleep Runs. The first time you sugar spoon my mouth, I'm sweetly on the cusp of danger. I spasm in my sleep. I dream like I am ticking. An orange clockwork of orgasms one moment and a TNT can unscrew the next. I want you to know the exact alchemy of my body, to understand chipazon, how my ancestors moved running, belts fastened, sandals on their feet, but chipazon. How do I explain to you when I sleep? I'm searching for a specific solitude I have not yet discovered. How do I tell you that I was trained to sprint backwards until the grains of sand ticking in my neck slowed down back to before my father was bankrupt of his country? 
Can I tell you how Moses and I laughed about blood right wrapped in burden and burden too beautiful to ungift, too impossible to both break apart and bundle back together, too enveloped in sacrifice and better life to free out its separate presence. Can I describe how we parachuted ourselves like heirlooms, ballooning the sky, all ground given up for us to soar to the edge of an unfinished inheritance? So Moses and I laughed, read Ocean Vong, swiped on the pattern, hoping to find the language it seems you do not search for. But my baby, all my friends in this place are still digging, searching the Pisces in their blood, stretching away their grief, YouTubing self-care, tying their hair back to the first brush stroke somewhere where immigrant parents did not paint over their kids, somewhere where our bodies were not borrowed time, somewhere where we all slept before the war, somewhere where we could name. How I wish to explain to you how badly I fixate on what I cannot name because to break open the blanks in my body is to let all of myself run out. Dear God, I am like you, a boy within the mud of a woman, my gender built from clay and blood and sparkly rock from Jerusalem. I am mothering with no gender. I am praying for every woman who is not allowed to read from the Torah. I sit and I pray and I pray and I pray until I memorize the words. I hang up my hands. All my mothers remember a Bible threaded with a husband stitch. All my mothers remember hell for the gays and not Shemayim, heaven in Hebrew where there is no gender. Somewhere I know that all my mothers remember ancient tongues sculpted us in full tongue before the language of imperialism. I'm learning how to pronounce my original self. Zahar, Nakiva, Androgynous, Tum Tum, Elonit, Saris. One, Zahar. This is how you shall eat it, but cheap as on. It's okay to rest, it's okay to stop. Two, Nakiva. Jews in every generation have experienced Mitzrayim, being trapped in the places, physical and metaphorical, where we were silenced for being ourselves. When I went to the Western Wall, I knew that God knew who I was, trans and queer. The Wailing Wall is a place that my parents speak fondly of. Perhaps it's because they prayed to get out of Israel, to come to Canada, to stop running. Perhaps they prayed for me to be born. Whatever it is, they tell me their prayers were heard like a miracle. Three, androgynous. We make rules ruling what is okay, what is not okay, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. In Orthodox communities, in the morning, men say, blessed are you that I was not created a woman. And women say, blessed am I that God created me according to God's will. Four, Tom Tom. And yet in the oldest forms of Judaism, in the Talmud, in classic Jewish law, there are many spiritual roles outside of gender binary categories, but perhaps we forgot them or perhaps we've never forgot anything. I remember that I'm Jewish in the way I remember how my hands feel. I remember that I'm trans as I walk through space. The mystical text of the Kabbalah addresses the notion of transi transitioning from one gender to another. Jacob's daughter, Dina, was born with the soul of a man, and yet through divine intervention was transitioned into a woman. The Kabbalah teaches that Abraham's son, Isaac, was conceived with the soul of a woman, and born as a man to further his familial connection to God. The mystical practice presents this idea of cycling of souls, the reincarnation of souls in diverse gender identities. Through this way, souls and bodies were never confined within binaries of sex or gender. In January 2015, a transgender Jewish woman, Kay Long, was denied access to the Wailing Wall, first by the women's section and then by the men's. When I went, I stood on the women's section and thought of her, my trans sisters, brothers, and siblings, beautiful trans people, carving a space of worship somewhere in our ancestry that sometimes forgets about us. I watched the wall between us, men and women, grow into a secular practice before my eyes. Five, Elonit. Transphobia is secular because transness was always innate to Judaism. The journey of a transgender person is like the journey of the child of Israel. To be trans or to be a child of Israel is to leave everything known for something completely unknown, to unbecome and then to become again. 
5. Saris. During Yom Kippur afternoons when we read the book of Jonah, we read the story of desperation of not being able to live up to the true identity of ourselves. In Jonah's case, this means to not live as the prophet he knew himself to be. He wanted to kill himself out of the pain of not being his divine path. This is a story too familiar for trans people. To face yourself, to know that the fear of being anything but yourself is much more painful than not living. Sometimes I look at the mirror the way I look at the wailing wall. I think to myself what it means to be trans and to be Jewish. This is, to be this is not to be afraid of even the scariest thing that you might be. As we die, as we let it go, we watch as we are meant to be protected. The death of our living as our untrue selves is an awakening to our divinity. Seven, man. A woman should not put on the apparel of a man, nor should a man wear the clothing of a woman. For whoever does this is completely off limits to your eternal God. This mitzvah could be a sacred duty to present the truth of your gender. The Torah wants us to be our true selves, and while there's a danger in fulfilling this mitzvah for trans people, the truth is that Judaism wants us to celebrate who we really are. Rabbi Lisa Edwards says, this verse prohibits hiding your true self, not hiding yourself behind clothes that don't belong to you, that don't show who you are, that don't allow you to feel like yourself when you're wearing them. Eight, woman. The Torah itself mentions transness in its most divine formation again and again. In the image of God, tells us transness was created in the image of God. Genesis 127 says God created Adam in God's image. In the image of God, created him male and female. God created them. In Judaism, from running to being trapped, to being stuck in the belly of a whale as we give up, to crying blood from the emotional pain of becoming what we were always meant to be, we Jews see again how much power there is facing what we fear most, to look at ourselves within a mirror, to claim our names and expressions and identities is when God speaks through us. Well, thank you so much everybody for listening. <laughs> thank you for the claps. Um, yes, so that was a little bit um, of my work. Um, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, it was um, really, really lovely to share that with you. Um, and I'll open it to my two friends in case they have any questions that they want to ask me about the process. Thank you so much, Angelic, for your amazing poetry. Um, I, I love going to poetry shows and like writing notes, like mm. the nerd I am. Mm. But I caught so many beautiful fragments. Um, I'm, I, I, I'd love to just like share them. Um, mm -hmm. How badly I fixate on what I cannot name. Ooh. Mm -hmm. um, mothering with no gender. Um, cycling of souls and bodies that were never meant to stay confined within binaries. Mm -hmm. um, carving a space of worship where we are often forgotten. Mm. Um, you also touched on clothing, you touched on excavating basically ancient Jewish knowledge and mm -hmm. the Torah, and there's just so much there. And my question for you is uh, your, your poem, Eight Divine Genders Peas. I was wondering if you can talk a little more about that, and mainly because I was really struck by the piece. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for picking out those lines too. Um, yeah, and I see in the chat too, mothering with no gender. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in that piece, what I'm working through the most, um, though I am working through some other things, but the, one of the, the main things that I was kind of dealing with or trying to organize in myself was like um, this discovery that I had that was kind of like off limits that was kind of not talked about in the Jewish circles that I was a part of, which is that there were these really distinct um, sex identities, these intersex identities um, that have been also claimed as distinct gender identities um, that speak to different transgender experiences or different intersex experiences within Judaism. And um, that was kind of like forgotten or like um, abandoned and then um, 
I was trying to work through with each gender in that poem. I go through that list, like one, Zahar, two, androgynous, like, et cetera. And I tried to unpack the difference between transphobia or homophobia and Judaism. And I tried to kind of see um, where those things are often so conflated and tangled, uh, trying to kind of see what the truth is. And like one of those things that I do in that poem is I talk about um, this mitzvah that says, uh, you know, men should not dress in the garments of a woman and a woman should not dress in the garments of a man. And then I later say, well, that's very true. In fact, Judaism says, be yourself. So if you are a trans woman, dress as a woman. If you are a trans man, dress as a man. Dress as who you are. If you're non-binary, dress as who you are. Whatever that means to you. Um, whereas obviously people have took that line. Uh, unfortunately, I don't want to say obviously, but unfortunately people have took that line and to mean something that it does not mean. When in fact, um, anything that I believe, anything that can be seen or witnessed in these sacred texts, um, especially in ancient Hebrew, um, I think does really beautifully speak to trans experiences. There's all these gender queer deities, uh, you know, always uh, hanging out. And I think it's just so beautiful and it like inspires me with such amazing magic and possibility. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so that was kind of like the work of that poem was like, oh, I want to really go and like see those things, um, such as like the Wailing Wall where they separate men and women. Um, you know, I want to go and think about how they separate men and women in a synagogue. I want to think about all these things and see uh, where is the truth behind that veil? How far can we dig and excavate, as you said, like those ancient teachings that exist um, that have been um, forgotten or misremembered uh, because uh, like the other line that you pulled out is I do really believe that our experiences were always a part of these ancient practices. Our lives are always a part of these ancient practices, um, but it's just through violence and imperialism and et cetera that those, um, those practices were um, intentionally erased or uh, yeah, like even for instance, um, the uh, I, I remember reading about a uh, a library in I think it was in the Soviet Union that was a specifically like a trans library. I could be wrong. If somebody's right, if somebody knows exactly where this was in the in the chat, you can comment. But it was bombed by the Nazis, and it had it was a whole library about trans experiences, and then it was just you know it was just gone. Like all those texts were gone um, that had a lot of this knowledge. So. Um, I think sometimes part of my work as a poet is the work of a magical historian. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks so much for your question, Kim. I also have a question. I'm really resonating with this idea of excavating, Angelic. I've seen you perform many times and like that is my experience of your work is like as you are conjuring, as you're speaking, like I'm also feeling that unpacking and that moving through that. Mm carrying me into um, and it's a really it's a really unique experience and I, I really uh, felt the emotion like in all of your pieces and I was really curious because in one of your poems um, you mentioned Israel um, I'm curious what Israel means to you and how your connection to that informs your work and also your queerness oh wow thank you um, <laughs> also a massive question so I'll try not to like talk for a super long time um, but uh, one of the things I say in my poems is like um, how I was trained to run backwards back until the back until the grains of sand ticking in my neck slow down back to before my father was bankrupt of his country. And that is a direct kind of conversation and relationship about the displacement of Jewish people within Soviet Russia, which is my family comes from the USSR um, and Jews were like really, really intensely prosecuted consistently they had the word Jew printed on their passport they couldn't attend universities um, that they wanted to like they're out of just like um, really really intense institutional anti-semitism um, and so a lot of those people who were in Soviet Russia in the 1990s they a lot of them flee to Israel like um, hundreds of thousands of people but um, a lot of people were actually not accepted into Israel. And that's something that I'm kind of working through in my poem too. Um, 
in, in a lot of various ways is thinking about like that. And there's a specific word, um, which was which was referred to Russian people who tried to enter Israel uh, to escape anti-Semitism and then were not allowed. And then they were sent into prisons in uh, Soviet Russia. They were put into labor camps. There was like a really intense history there. And that was in the 1990s. Um, and so my parents, did end up going to Israel and seeking refuge. But then within Israel, there was a lot of anti-Russian hatred. Um, there was a club, there was a Russian club that was bombed. And like that experience kind of like made people look at Russian people differently and be like, oh, you finally suffered enough to be in this country. Um, so the wound in which uh, I think a lot of Soviet Jews hold with Israel is really, really um, complicated. Um, specifically, and I'm only talking about my lineage and my experience with that, um, because there's a lot of other wounds, um, a lot of different ways, specifically within other um, Soviet um, capacities. But so that's something that I'm kind of like thinking about in terms of like how does honoring and like remembering those histories that were so ignored and erased and like I can't read about them in textbooks. Um, finding them and being able to speak to them and how that also kind of parallels these kind of forgotten histories of trans experiences or queer experiences. And so really this, this work is all about just like claiming all of this back and like remembering all of this again. Um, so I can find myself and I can answer that question. Like, am I Jewish? Am I Russian? Cause like, I really grew up being so confused because um, my parents were always like, don't mention that you're Jewish, don't mention that you're Russian, because they lived in so much fear, um, whether it was in the Soviet Union for one thing or in Israel for another thing. Um, and then I grew up in fear of being queer. So all those things are really, really similar to me um, in that way. But I could talk about it for forever, but thank you for that question. Uh, maybe we can talk more later in the conversation. I really appreciate you both for those beautiful questions, but I wanna pass the mic. Uh, to Kim Mortal. Um, oh, just kidding, Alicia. <laughs> um, so Alicia is a first generation Afro-Caribbean performer whose poetry and music is rooted in ancestral technologies and futures. Um, so Alicia has been one of my favorite poets and artists for so long, just dropped an album called Essence. Uh, we're gonna throw that into the chat so you can check it out. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Alicia. Hello. I'm super grateful to be sharing this with you today. This song, Vulnerability, is from my EP, which just dropped yesterday. So it's a really special set of tracks that I worked on with Adam Shake. Um, this song that I'm going to share now is called Vulnerability. And I wrote it to inspire folks to remember love as a practice of freedom within relationships and community um, within our political responsibilities our social responsibilities so I hope that it inspires you <laughs> Just for lovers No time will bring you others Life is ceaselessly dancing Between yes and no There's something Rest in peace, my love. 
and our claps for Alicia. That was so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, 
my friend um I just felt so like I just your your voice and your presence and everything about you and your music um is like such a perfect healing frequency for my body like it literally transmutates things in me when I hear you sing um yeah it's just so nice like it just it just does that ultimately like right away um and I want to ask you if you um yeah where do you where do you find that where does that inspiration come to you to be able to deliver music in that way like how do you discover those sounds well first of all thank you that is such an honor to hear you say that um and an honor that that's what it offers to you um I think that <clears throat> when I was younger is when I kind of learned um how to uh, move energy in a way that's conducive to healing. And when I was a teenager, I first learned how to do that through body work and through actually working on other people's tissues and um, supporting their uh, bodily systems to return to like a balance. And over the years, it's kind of transitioned. Like um, there was a while when I was really using plants or like tending to the land and, um, this now recently it's kind of coming through you know my voice and it's also very much an intention and a, and a practice um i practice hindustani kayal vocal tradition um shout out to akhil who's my teacher in the um he's in our, a participant today um and i think that that was one of my biggest sort of inspirations uh was starting to learn that tradition which um is related to Vedic science and yogic science. And within that um, culture, there is like mantra, which, you know, in Western culture, people make their own mantras and attach their own meaning to them. But there's also ancient, ancient mantras and ancient words that actually correspond to different parts of the body. And speaking them, that is, their, that is what their purpose is to realign um, energy fields within the body and to return harmony. Um, not saying I don't, I'm not, I'm not trained in that, you know, high level of, of mantra and um, music, but you know, that's something that I definitely use as my own therapy, you know, when I'm, when I'm feeling low and um, when I'm just improvising is like just experimenting and playing and, you know, seeing what comes through. But also I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned from um, Hindustani, uh, music is that the beauty of improvisation and spontaneity comes through devotion and hard work and practice. So it's having both that allows a balance and emergence to show up. Thanks for that question. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, I also just wanted to say, Alicia, you look amazing. <laughs> Thank Angelic, you. you look amazing. Um, yeah, you're, you're amazing. Like that song, when I first heard your voice in that room that only captured your voice, um, you have the, the soothing, calming, like, uh, I felt like I was by the water. Mm -hmm. Um, and your music is as described a portal to a meditative mind. And um, a lot of the lyrics you had in your song were really beautiful. Like, life is ceaselessly dancing between the yes and no, which was so beautiful. Um, rooted in flow, these are fragments um, that I captured. Let your heart lead, I will never own you. I am holy, all that I ever need. Um, and wholeness, which is like a beautiful word. And my question for you, Alicia, is um, what does it mean to connect to that wholeness and also to these ancestral connections and to our queer ancestors for you through your music? Yeah, thanks for that. Oh, I think that for me, um, within particularly like my father's lineage, whose his family comes from Jamaica, 
and we uh, my my ancestors on his side um were brought there through the transatlantic slave trade i think that um there's this very like real uh understanding for me of like the histories of violence and trauma that come with that experience and that was experienced by my family um and i am very completely aware of the fact of how different that is from my present reality here in a very privileged, safe um, life that I have I have built and, and my you know my parents have built with me. Um, so I think that that practice of wholeness is a very intentional um, gift that I strive to give to myself um, because I I I I feel so honored and also um, amazed to be in this place where I, I have such a, um, such agency, I guess, in the way I relate to other people, in the way I relate to the land. Um, and so I think that's a lot of the practice for me. Um, uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you so much, Alicia. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, that was so, so, uh, so beautiful. I'm still sitting with this idea of devotion and wholeness. Um, do you have anything else you would want to say about your work today? Mm, I mean, I guess I'll share that I'm like so over the moon with the release that happened yesterday. Um, I saw some people in the chat talking about it and it's just been really uh, such a celebratory time for me. Like I was talking to my um, my mom yesterday and she was literally like, her face was, her mouth was open. She was like, is that you singing? Like, <laughs> and um, yeah, I just, I, I am so grateful for Angelic for you putting this together and to be sharing the stage with both, both the two of you um, is definitely an honor. So thanks for listening everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Alicia. Um, I really resonate too with what you said about like um, being here in this in this new space where you're, um, yeah, you're reckoning with these past histories, but you're also aware of the new privileges that you have um, in this land and in this timeline. And I think that's something that we kind of weave through in all three of our sets is this idea of like time and space and where we are now in our new position and reckoning with that, with um, those histories or those presences um, and those ancestors. And um, which uh, brings me to our next performer who I think does a lot of time jumping both in comedy and in joy and in grief and in sorrow and like everything in between. Um, we're gonna have Kim Mortal, who is my favorite rapper of all time <laughs> and an amazing poet. And yeah, let me pass the stage to Kim Mortal. Hi everybody, my name is Kim Mortal. I'm gonna be sharing two poems and two tracks. It's my first poem and it's untitled. When I was young, I couldn't sing soprano like the other girls in choir. So I told myself that I couldn't sing. When I was older, I sang an old kundiman in Lula's dress, my voice so low it shook the ground. I chose the song because I wanted to sing like the man in the suit, but I did not want to be the man. Guy friends used to play punch me in the arm, treat me like a bro, cause I wasn't straight, cause I wasn't interested. He didn't know he tickled me, that identity is a fickle thing, that our moment didn't have to be gendered. If I present myself as a question mark, will people try to sentence me, try to period me, try to answer? I don't know but I'll keep singing old songs and they will come out of my body, floating, real, and new. This next song is called Brushing By Heaven's Shoulder.
I'm at a place where I'm getting tired of the same thing Sometimes coffee don't suffice to wake me from my sleep Every day I pray to fill my life in this space While they say you're so ungrateful, babe You think too far ahead Don't you see what's right in front of you? Why are you so behind? Look at everything you have Everything you have Look at everything you have Everything you have But I would much rather that you speak to me In a different language Because this home is not my own And my tongue only knows silence And if this place cannot hold me, I don't have to stay. Why does it seem like I can never finish? But my home is a search and my life is scattered And my art has no home, I ask does it even matter? It's like I'm only offered glimpses scratching on the surface But as I'm brushing by heaven's shoulder I hope I'm getting bolder But as I'm brushing by heaven's shoulder I hope I'm getting bolder, bolder Yeah, yeah, ooh So we'll be criticized for loving outside of these lines So I'll be criticized for looking outside of these lines So we'll be criticized for loving outside of these lines so we'll be criticized for loving outside of these lies, lies. Ooh. 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 But as we're brushing by heaven shoulder I hope we're getting bolder but as I'm brushing by heaven's shoulder I know I'm getting bolder but as we're brushing by heaven's shoulder I know we're getting bolder but as we're brushing by heaven's shoulder I know we're getting bolder My next piece is a poem and it's about my dad 
I have your Tagalog English dictionary on my shelf, and I am reminded of your absence. You would outlet in letters of complaint, come to our doorway to check spelling. I now wonder if the white people caught your grammar and stopped reading. Eternal boy child, Chanela slipping in the kitchen, making gorilla faces, and my favorite, Tortang Talong. You'd close up on strangers' asses in home videos of our swimming lessons. Behind your magnifying glass, I had never seen such quiet hyper-focus. Charcoal on your bristles, skinny brushes, kneadable eraser, never a blemish. I'm thinking of erasing you from my name, not centering you in my frame. When kids ask about my artistic talent, why I love drawing the face. Your desktop background was a charming self-portrait of a disciplinarian with cuff sleeves rolled up. When you pulled us close, you smelled like Powis and Jurgen's lotion, rough in your affection, glass in corners I swept up. They call it daddy issues. I call it violence, trapped in a car with your strong cologne on our way to church. The song is about racism and Canada's immigration system. Back in the Philippines, I had a neuroscience degree. Now I'm the garbage man for Canadian families. My parents think that it is such a tragedy. I say, don't worry, I'm happy. Show them a photo, look at the size of my truck. I say, that's me right there. Doesn't my uniform look good on me? 36K salary, how can I complain? I say, don't worry, I'm happy. Rain, snow, or summer heat. I'm laughing with my work buddies. One man's trash is another's to clean. They don't even see me. I FaceTime mom, show her my room of treasures at the back. Piles of chairs and TVs that I hoarded from their trash. She smiles out of pity and asks if I'm okay. I say, don't worry. I'm happy. Papa tells me to put my degree to use. But I love the smell of Tuesday morning garbage juice. These alleys are their neural pathways. He don't know I'm studying this country's brain. Don't worry. I'm happy. Don't worry, I'm happy. Rain, snow, or summer heat, I'm laughing with my work buddies. One man's trash is another's to clean. They don't even see me, they don't even see. Yes, throw your claps and your heart up for Kim Mortal. Um, that was so, so lovely. Um, Alicia, you look like you have a question. It just looks I do have a question. Oh, yeah. Kim, your voice is so beautiful, like sweet calamansi. <laughs> 
And I really love how you are continually defining, defying genre. Like that last song had like such a punk vibe to it to me. Um, and I know one of the more recent songs you released, What Are You Doing? That one's like Kim instrumental, like way more, just like a totally different vibe. And I love, I love how like true you are to your own artistry and how, you know, you have that fluidity with where you're moving. It's really inspiring. Um, yeah, and I noticed like in your set today, you mentioned a lot about like the the traumas or the violence or like the heaviness that is passed down like through your community, through your lineage. And I'm just curious about what gifts you feel like you received from your queer ancestors and from your community. Like how does that show up in who you are? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, um, I find that a lot of my poems that I shared, the second one was about my father. The first one was commenting on how when I was young, I just didn't think that I could sing because I couldn't sing high notes. And um, that falls into like, oh, I'm not like, I can't sing soprano. I'm not girly enough. Um, I'm not, I just don't fit. And um, a lot of my art is about reclaiming my art and music and being fluid within um, the genres, like you said. And um, that second poem really hit me. Um, that was my first time performing it. And um, I find it funny because today is my dad's birthday and I haven't talked to my dad for years. And that poem feels so good to release into the world. Um, because I wanted to share it um, because I find that in my art too, um, I'm unlearning, I'm unlearning colonial mentality. Um, I'm unlearning, um, you know, patriarchal ways that I was in for so long. And um, I'm also honoring the fact that my dad is a phenomenal visual artist. I grew up sitting on his lap and watching charcoal portraits come to life of like people, people's faces, you know? And like, um, I'm reclaiming my art and I'm healing through it and I'm working with my hands. And um, I was told when I was young from my aunts um, that I have um, healot hands and they would make me massage them <laughs> at like family reunions. Um, and I also have this like strong desire to laugh. And I feel like laughing and comedy is so necessary every day to our um, exuberance and our sustenance. And that's why there's so many, there's so many brilliant, funny Filipinos because humor was a tool to get us through, you know, just like music, just like visual art. And um, that's definitely a desire I have to do through my art to be childlike again and to laugh and to make others laugh. And um, I also attribute my voice to my mom because my mom has such a powerful voice. Like she is very fearless. Sometimes her anger is, um, uh, the sources of it are interesting <laughs> as in like problematic, but um, I definitely pull from her desire to speak up, you know, and to, to use like my privileges to speak up and to name what's not talked about, not named. Um, yeah, and I feel like I have, uh, I'm very attuned to like artistic visions. Like I love, I'm very visual. And so there's, there's, I just feel like my ancestors are so gifted and they always pull me to, like you said, in your art, in your lyrics, like that wholeness is something I feel when I'm singing and when I'm performing, like, I feel like um, I'm embodying the present 
And I feel like that's where my ancestors want me to be. They want me to be in the present. Um, yeah, and I find that when I'm making art, Wow. Um, I just feel like your lyrics, they to me hold so much immediate truth and radical presence. Like that's exactly what they hold for me. Like it just feels like they, um, yeah, I just feel completely with you and it feels so direct and honest and like simple and elegant. Um, which I think all truth, like when you speak truth, it is simple ultimately. And just lines that you had about like, um, yeah, silence and um, not feeling, not knowing your place within a home and then um, your body, or I can't quite remember the, the exact lyric, but only knowing silence, um, that really stuck out to me. And also this idea of loving outside of the lines. Or uh, also, I really, it really hit me too when you said um, um, your line about the question mark, like what happens if I'm only a question mark? Will people, how will people respond to me then? Because that's kind of how I feel like people who are, as you so um, beautifully kind of work through, like people who um, live in these queer bodies, um, that's how we often, um, feel like I feel really strongly about that it's like what does it mean to be a question mark somebody else's answer somebody else's story or prescription and like finding ourselves through that um so to me like I just felt so much like beautiful discovery um a sense of finding home within yourself about the set um which was so so uh yeah also alchemizing for me as well um but I would love to ask you if you if you want to share um, just more about like your experience with queer homeland as a theme and how that um, intersected or interwove with what you chose to perform for us today. Quotes. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah. Well, the first uh, the first poem. Um, or on the topic of queer homeland, I was thinking about um, uh, one of the lyrics in my song, Brushing by Heaven's Shoulder is, um, I would much rather that you speak to me in a different language, cause this home is not my own and my tongue only no silence. And if this place cannot hold me, I don't have to stay. Um, and that I wrote, in my, well, as an art student, strumming on my guitar, coming up with lyrics, uh, like just really journal, journal entry type. Like I would e take excerpts from my journal and bring it into song. And um, the other lyric that stuck out to me was, um, uh, will be criticized when, um, will be criticized for loving outside of these lines. And it's like, I, borders, you know, binaries, um, limitations, imagine limitations and queering the space. And um, I was also thinking about like being Filipinx Canadian and the all the questions that come with that and how I always feel like a question mark or I always feel like an ellipsis, you know, or I always feel like a blank space. And um, I'm just fluid. I'm always, I'm always expanding. I'm always on this journey. And so um, we're making home and I'm finding home in my body and I'm encouraged to come home. Um, my friends encourage that in me. You know, that's where that came from. And um, yeah, I, I feel that with my music, I'm trying to always answer these questions of like, where are we? Who am I? Why do I do this? <laughs> uh, 
what is love to me? What like always defining things, trying to hear myself because so often I feel like I'm on the outside looking in. And so I'm, I always say this, but I feel like I'm challenged to be here through creating and through redefining. And so it becomes this like, I need to practice this to hear myself and to hear others. Thank you so much, everyone. That was so beautifully put, Kim. Um, if I could ask, just because we're running a bit low on time and we're a bit over time, um, if I could ask all three of you to just synthesize um, in a few words, one, two, a few words, um, your set, um, your texts, your writing, yeah, your experiences. Um, yeah, I feel, I think I'm going to keep these two words imagined limitations with myself and, um, yeah, um, knowing ourselves to be true despite what Kim so beautifully described binaries and borders and prescription, um, and coming home into ourselves. I think for me, one thing I'm taking away from our chat is magic, being a magical historian and sort of excavating both in the past, but also in the future as a way of making space and clearing forward for those um, who are silenced. I really hold on to what Alicia said about um, being a being, <laughs> being a being that is conducive to healing. That really spoke to me. Um, and also, I have a question for myself, which is like, what is wholeness to me? I think that's like a beautiful question. And um, angelic. I was really um, moved by the research and the excavation, like that is badass. Um, and to find ourselves in our spiritual practices is like integral. And I feel like I've been so torn from that. And so this is, it was encouraging to see both of you um, be so powerful and so connected in your work. And so I'm really encouraged and I really love this event. So thank you so much for bringing us together. Thank you. I'm so honored um, to be in the presence of you all and to have had the opportunity to hear and witness you all perform. And um, I'd like to thank Moa for giving a voice and a platform to queerness, to the non-binary, to being heard when you're a part of varying diasporas. Um, it's super refreshing. And I'd like to thank Jill Baird, uh, the head of Department of Public Programs for helping co-curate this event and to all of our amazing panelists today for sharing their voice, opinions and their perspectives and especially Angelic for bringing everyone together. Um, I hope to see everyone in our audience again at our next event. And as always, we hope you keep an eye out for more events through the Museum of Anthropology. You can find out about our next events by visiting moa.ubc.ca. Thank you everyone and have a lovely evening. I'm gonna leave the chat function and I'll keep the Zoom meeting going for a little